Shalom and welcome to Davar Word. It is my pleasure to share with you what I have discovered in my walk so that we can learn and grow together. Are you a person of your word? Are you someone who can be counted on to keep your promises? Do others trust you to be dependable? Do you acknowledge your commitments? Sometimes we act without thinking carefully first and therefore make mistakes or behave foolishly. Sometimes we make promises which are too hasty and then we live to regret it. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2 says, Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Ecclesiastes 5 verses 4 to 5 When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. In Judges 11 verses 30 to 31, Jephthah made a promise to God, but did Jephthah kill his daughter? Did Jephthah really make such a promise and end up killing his own daughter? Did Jephthah end his own daughter's life like how Abraham would have sacrificed Isaac if God had not intervened by providing a ram? Did Jephthah's daughter have any say in it? Did God accept human sacrifices? Isn't this like following the practices of the other surrounding nations of human sacrifice? Exodus 22.28 says, You shall give me the firstborn. You shall give me the firstborn among your sons. Exodus 22.29 You shall do the same with your cattle and your flocks. Seven days it shall remain with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. Exodus 34.19 modifies the law by suggesting that firstborns are not to be given to God but should instead be redeemed or replaced by livestock or money. Every first issue of the womb is mine from all your livestock that drop a male as firstling, whether cattle or sheep. Exodus 34.20 But the firstling of a donkey you shall redeem with a sheep. If you do not redeem it, you shall break its neck, and you must redeem every firstborn among your sons. None shall appear before me empty-handed. This is not the first time in the Torah that a child offering is replaced by something else. At the end of the story of the binding of Isaac, Abraham offered a ram in place of his son, Isaac. Leviticus 22 Anyone among the Israelites or among the strangers residing in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Molech shall be put to death. The people of the land shall pelt him with stones. Deuteronomy 18.10 Let no one be found among you who consigns his son or daughter to the fire. The worship of the horrific idol Molech is mentioned in Leviticus 18.21. Molech was worshipped by hitting a metal statue representing the god until it was red hot. Then, by placing a living infant or child on the outstretched hands of the statue while beating drums drowned out the screams of the child until it burned to death. The offering of infants to Molech was actual human sacrifice. There is the story of King Misha who sacrificed his firstborn son to repel an Israelite invasion so that he could win the battle. This was dramatic. 2 Kings 3.26 The king of Moab, seeing that the battle was going against him, he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him up on the wall as a burnt offering. A great wrath came over Israel, so they withdrew from him and went back to their own land. The sacrifice appears to have worked, but how exactly? Whose wrath is being described? 
Was it the great wrath of the Moabite high god Chemosh who helped his people defeat the Israelite attack? Alternatively, was it the Lord's anger? It is difficult to accept the possibility of the king of Moab sacrificing his own son. The sight of his son being offered as a sacrifice crushed everyone and anger was turned against Israel. The scriptures admonish against a specific ritual, burning a child for Molech. This was being practiced among Israelites. The existence of child sacrifice among the Israelites is stated explicitly in Kings. Listen to King Josiah's reforms. 2 Kings 23.10 He also defiled the Tophet, which is in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, so that no one might consign his son or daughter to the fire of Molech. Jeremiah 7.30 For the people of Judah have done what displeases me, declares the Lord. And they have built the shrines of Tophet in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in fire, which I never commanded, which never came to my mind. This suggests that the Tophet was an area in the valley of Ben-Hinnom where the Judeans sacrificed their own offspring following ancient practices of other nations. The Torah does not offer a clear reason why a father should sacrifice his son. The laws in Exodus imply that the firstborn son is God's due, just as firstborn animals are. To put it another way, perhaps this was understood by some Israelites as part of the covenant. In Genesis 22, verses 1 to 19, the story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac expresses similar ambivalence about child sacrifice. God and Abraham entered into a berit, a covenant, whereby a son, Isaac, was born to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was promised that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in heaven. In turn, Abraham would accept the will and lordship of God. To test the faithfulness of Abraham to this covenant, God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son on the top of Mount Moriah. Abraham and Isaac, accompanied by two young men, rose up early in the morning to begin their journey. When they approached their destination, Abraham and Isaac proceeded alone. The altar was made ready. Isaac carried the wood for the fire. Genesis 22.8 And the two walked together. This described both father and son to be of one mind. Did Isaac actually encourage his father and was he willing to be the sacrifice? Are we certain that this was his real feeling? Did it destroy the family? What effect did it have on his mother? Why did Isaac need to be tied? Was he struggling to live? Abraham showed his willingness to offer to God his most precious possession. As Abraham lowered the knife to cut the neck of Isaac, an angel called out to Abraham once and then a second time to stop the killing. A ram appeared and the animal was offered as a sacrificial substitute. Violence directed towards a human being was redirected to an animal that was substituted as a sacrifice. The ending of the story is very troubling. In Genesis 22:19, the conclusion of the text says that Abraham returned unto the young men and they journeyed to Beersheba. Where was Isaac? It seems that Abraham left the place of sacrifice without Isaac. Isaac could not continue on with his father. Perhaps he needed time to recuperate physically emotionally, or both. In the next chapter, we read that Sarah died. Why? Did Sarah die of sorrow or grief that Abraham would do such a thing as to sacrifice his own son? Judges chapter 11, verses 1 to 40. For 18 years, Israel suffered under the cruel yoke of the Ammonites. Jephthah was an attacking and plundering warrior. Jephthah's misfortune was to be the son of a prostitute, 
or his father's concubine. His father, Gilead, had a number of sons from his wife, and when these boys grew up, they drove Jephthah away out of the house of the family so that he would not inherit anything from his father. He was persuaded to save Israel from bondage to the enemy. Jephthah vowed unto the Lord that if he delivered the children of Ammon into his hands, if God granted him victory over the Ammonites, then whatever or whoever came out of the door of his house to meet him on his safe return from the Ammonites would belong to Hashem and would be offered to Hashem as a burnt offering. The one who came out from the door of his house to greet him on his return would belong to the Lord and he would offer up that person or possibly animal as a burnt offering. Jephthah successfully vanquished the Ammonites and won the victory. But his celebration turned to mourning and he tore his clothes when he realised that it was his only child, his daughter, who was first to greet him with drums, timbrels and with dance. Painfully, Jephthah proclaimed that he had no choice but to honour his vow. Jephthah's daughter accepted her fate but made a request of her father before the vow was to be fulfilled. Judges 11, 37, she said to her father, Do this for me, release me for two months, and I will go and go down upon the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my woman companions. Jephthah's daughter supported him in his decision, but asked for two months to experience the world that would escape her, to cry over the emptiness of her life accompanied by her friends. Jephthah agreed, and his daughter and her women companions went and wept for her virginity on the mountains. After two months, she returned and was put to death while still a virgin. Perhaps Jephthah's daughter really did become a sacrifice under the Kerem ban, consecration and dedication unto the Lord. According to Leviticus 27, 28, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. The death of Jephthah's daughter might even be regarded as an act of martyrdom, something like Samson's willingness to die for the sake of his God and his people. Many interpreters still believe that the story ends with her death. This act is, however, condemned. Josephus, a Jewish historian, in his writings, The Antiquities, wrote that Jephthah sacrificed his daughter as a holocaust and the sacrifice was neither lawful nor pleasing to God. The rashness of Jephthah's vow is not the legitimacy of a human sacrifice. Perhaps Jephthah's daughter coming out first to meet him was a sort of punishment from heaven for his rash vow. This is the simple reading of the story's ending. But some commentators, Radak and Ralbak, note that the text never directly said that Jephthah sacrificed her. They have argued against the human sacrifice and concluded that Jephthah didn't really sacrifice her. They claim that she was secluded and survived as a perpetual virgin, separated from everyone and everything except for four days each year. Israelite women would make a pilgrimage to see Jephthah's daughter every year. Once a year, she would receive a visit in her isolation from her companions who would call out to her. Jephthah's daughter was clearly troubled by giving up her future as a mother. She cried about it for two months together with her friends. All the women of Israel do so for four days every year until Jephthah's daughter finally died. We are told that Jephthah's daughter did not know a man. If she was actually sacrificed, then this information is irrelevant. This perception is strengthened by the extreme emphasis on virginity. She wept for her virginity. 
she truly saw herself as dedicated to God according to the vow. As a consequence, she accepted a fate different to that of other women. She accepted a life of seclusion. She asked that she and her friends be allowed to cry for two months for her virginity, not her death. The request was granted and she and her friends did in fact cry for her virginity. When the vow was fulfilled, we are told she never knew a man. This was a strange thing to say after recording the sacrifice of a virgin. Why is the emphasis on her remaining a virgin and not on her death? This suggests that she wasn't actually killed, but that she remained a virgin for the rest of her life. She sacrificed the most important priority affecting women in the biblical world, the necessity of having children. She took a vow of abstinence. Jephthah's own vow forced his daughter into permanent celibacy as a woman consecrated to the Lord. This girl was Jephthah's only child. Apart from her, he had neither son nor daughter. To lose her would mean it was the end of any long-term family or dynasty of Jephthah. Born to a woman who was outside the family, whether a prostitute or concubine, Jephthah would now be unable to pass on his status to another generation. The effect of his vow, whether the girl was really sacrificed or if she remained a virgin and never married, would rob Jephthah of his future. But we look at this girl's incredible faith. When her father seemed uncertain about whether to go through with the vow, she was the one who took responsibility for her faith and pushed him to do what he swore to God. We read her story and we pity her, but she was a woman to be admired for her faith. Keeping promises holds a lot of emotional value and when we break them, there is a decline of trust. The cost of not keeping our promises has painful consequences. There may be missed opportunities, damaged relationships, and we can be known as being unreliable. However, we should be careful of a binding oath, a promise or a vow made with much haste and little consideration, usually in the heat of emotion. Let us pray. Lord Messiah, Saviour, we thank you for the record of the story of Jephthah's daughter. We have learned so much about making rash promises to others and also to God that we are obligated to keep. God does not forget words that we have spoken. He values our words greatly because His own word does not return void. Help us, Lord, to not make promises that are hasty. Help us to take more consideration in our words. Help us to take responsibility for our faith and keep our promises made to God and other people. When we keep our promises, trust is built. Help us never to take this precious gift of trust for granted. In the mighty name of Yeshua, Beshem Yeshua, Bezekut Yeshua, Sa Shalom. Amen. Thank you for joining me. I pray that this message inspires and challenges you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.